<laughs> I felt very special. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and likewise, Carmel is a very generous educator and <laughs> person as well. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. And for this invitation, which is brilliant, I'm going to do it through because I'm actually in, um, I'm not too well lit here. So, probably it's all a bit spooky. I'm back in my apartment. It's all a little bit still in uh, uh, renovation mode. But I'm going to share my screen and talk you through the presentation that I've prepared. Um, so, uh, let me just make this big. Um, just before we, we spoke a few minutes before you all came in and uh, Carmel was saying, you don't have to just talk about textiles. You're welcome to talk about all the other things you do as well. Um, but it's actually a real privilege to talk about textiles for me because no one's asked me to do that before. <laughs> and, um, and I feel uh, it's all very new and... Um, and I feel honoured that I'm in in uh, in this kind of context with lots of um, lots of textile artists and people who work that way. So I I, I think I want to share you know where I am with it and and why I love it and how it connects to other things I do, not least drawing. Um, I'm illustrating this first introductory page with something that was it's um, an embroidery of a leaf that I picked up the other day that had beautiful colours. That's uh, on my table in my studio. And I have um, things like this on the go all the time and they've become increasingly important. Um, and when I finish one, um, I'm quite bereft and I'm sure people would identify with that, but uh, they're, they're works that I pick up when I have time and, um, and I get connected to. Um, so I was introduced as Chloe Briggs, but also lots of people um, know me through uh, Drawing is Free. Um, which I'll explain um, here. So uh, 10 years ago, uh, when I'd, I'd, I, I arrived in Paris 15 years ago, um, and was working in a, I still am as a teacher, but I, I was running a, a foundation program at an American private art school um, in Paris. And uh, to take the job there was was a really um, amazing invitation because I got to live in Paris. But what didn't kind of sit with me well was um, where my values lie in terms of education and uh, a private school is is a is a privileged space. So in order to almost like rectify that and um, and find a solution. Uh, I luckily was given permission uh, to use the school for an hour a week to invite anyone who wanted to to come and draw with me. And it was also a solution to uh, a kind of troubled school at a time and, and trying to, to make a space which was joyful, um, that was free from critique, um, that anyone could come to. So the heartbeat of this Drawing is Free project um, has always been Monday mornings, 9 to 10 a.m., which it now lots of you know from being online with me. Um, so I've continued, Drawing is Free has, has since that moment uh, taken many, many different forms. I've worked with lots of different institutions and artists, people from different age groups. Um, and, uh, but it's still um, the heartbeat, as I say, is this Monday morning meeting, which many of you take part. And we now do it in the evening as well to include people in different time zones. Uh, so we celebrated the 10 year anniversary of this. And it is quite mad now to think that I did this for 10 years, but um, it was also cheekily a way to, for myself to draw for an hour a week when I really had no time at all. And it meant that I started my week reminding myself that I was an artist and, and that has been key. And I think lots of people share that with me who join me on, uh, on Mondays. Um, so over the time, you know, I've worked with lots of students, but more recently, um, and I think there's a couple of you here, um, I am really lucky to work with artists once who I meet once a month um, to talk about their drawing practice and to encourage them. Actually, my friend Tanya Kovac said, um, that uh, I give people creative courage. <laughs> and that's probably one of the best things. So I thought that is perfect. If I, if I feel I can do that, that is, that is an amazing achievement. Um, so I'm giving others creative courage, but you know, I have to turn that back on to myself. Um, 
and you know I've got to practice what I preach and oftentimes I'm saying to people to uh, try and, and put into words what they do or try and be as clear and kind of authentic in words and a statement about the artist statement is very loaded it's something you get taught at art school and it often sounds really pretentious and um, <laughs> and like nothing anyone would ever read. So I tried to sit down and write something that was like distinctly what I thought my work was, and I'll just read it. Um, so my work as an artist is entwined in my teaching, making to learn and to share. My small home is my studio, not anymore as from September, <laughs> but I have a tiny studio now. And out of constraints of time and space, my work is a celebration of resourcefulness. And you'll see that in this presentation. Taking the pleasure of making as my core motivation. And that's the pleasure I encourage in every shape and form. <laughs> um, and my environment as my subject. So I'm often working from flowers on our table or plants in the window box or people that surround me. And the, small, the often small scale, seemingly provisional works are accumulating and record my life, the life of an artist. And that I had to I had to believe in and say strongly to myself, that's what it is, that's what I'm building. And I had to redefine what it was to be a successful artist. And that's been really key. Um, so in the drawing is free moments and and um, you know, kind of what I'm about really is the focus on the pleasure of making that's free from critical judgment. So the drawing is free um, idea is as much to um, enable my own making and my own um, free, um, joyful space to make. Um, it's connected to my life. Um, and then and then the learning that is that that I that comes from my practice is shared with others, and it becomes an ecosystem. And I've I really also had to rid that myth of the teaching sucks all your energy and then you have nothing left and you're a failed artist if you're a teacher. It's, it's very much, a, it moves um, and, and the people I work with give me as much back. Um, and then this unself-consciousness, um, which I hope I think happens on Monday, which is why we can draw so freely. And then, and then um, encouraging being bold and daring um, with this all this kind of manifesto in mind. So, with the, I was thinking about textiles. I was thinking, uh, where where did it? Because I studied fine art, and and where where did it begin? And 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 I realised I actually have a lot of drawings of garments, um, you know, that I've made in the past. The left on the left is a watercolour of my wedding dress. On the right are um, aprons hanging in our kitchen. So just loving fabric and loving patterns and um, and color, uh, and then um, and then collecting um, anything that's textile related from. Uh, in France, we call them vide grenier, which is uh, which means an empty attic. And there are moments in the year, often in autumn, where people um, streets are dedicated to um, people selling things that they want to get rid of. And this is an Yves Saint Laurent dress for 10 euros. Woohoo, like that's a very good. Point. So I get, you know, um, uh, looking for clothes, you know, and my mom had a collection of vintage dresses and I, and I, you know, I, I love them and uh, that's for, and then, and then threads, I have a real fetish for um, threads that I find in the, in the bottom of baskets that have been, you know, someone's attic they're throwing away and how I might then reuse them so beginning in lockdown which I think so many of us did so much began in lockdown didn't it <laughs> because we were just faced with our our own time and spaces and um I never thought to make a quilt until then like a lot of people didn't think to make um sourdough bread or whatever I think it's, it was one of those things where it just felt like that was a very comforting thing to do and what I needed rather than my expressive kind of vulnerable drawings was some kind of order and calm and straight lines and patience um I love a hot iron what that feels like to 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 calmly you know straighten something out the connection to the old fabrics that reminded me of childhood that I'd had around that um, pieces of my home and my past homes and my life. And, and then because we, you know, we were just 
like everyone, um, you know, just working with what you had. It's this making something out of nothing that I find magical. Um, and then discovering the G's Ben quilt makers, which, you know, I'm talking to textile lovers here, so I don't need to tell that story, but um, just amazing um, works of art um, made by women who had nothing. And um, yeah, so incredibly inspiring stuff. And then, so that was like my first basic one. And then it's like, well, I've got, you know, let it's like following a recipe or not. Um, you know, do I follow the recipe or do I invent? And I'm like, I need to follow some recipes strictly to understand, you know, like how, how different patterns are made. And I'm humble with textiles. I don't know. I mean, I think I I know quite a lot about charcoal by now, but I don't, I know hardly anything about um, skills from, about you know in textile world so looking at history reading books looking at youtube and then instagram and then friends showing me um and i actually have a neighbor who um who embroidered for jean paul gautier she lives on the second floor and uh, she's like chloe chloe i need to teach you no this is it's horrible what you're doing i've got to show you the correct stitches <laughs> you've got to do these kind of things and then I quickly she that I quickly um you know I did my lesson and then I that I went back on my own way <laughs> uh, actually talking about um uh yeah the the embroidery so I made this this summer in the heat wave um I took a book out of the local library near my parents um of embroidery stitches and I made this in order to learn them to teach my students and then I thought it'd be quite funny that I'd be wearing the um the teaching aid so it turns into a bit but, but actually my parents thought I shouldn't wear it because I look a bit mad in it <laughs> uh, at, well just going back to that I love the names the, I put all the French names but I love the connection to nature and you you know all, all my other work there's always a a love of the shapes and forms in in nature so I love the how um and also the kind of cultural differences in the textile, in the um, embroidery stitches. And another thing in lockdown was this amazing meeting with Angela, who some of you know, so Angela Maddock, who, um, who is a textile artist, and she really generously made these um, uh, boxes of repair kits during lockdown and, uh, and then offered a workshop to show you how to work, how to do it. And I was like the most eager student in that little session and was asking questions. And then she was like, well, I, I could give you some more, you know, some more uh, guidance. So we met and became friends since then. And that's my first ever repair job, <laughs> which now looks quite clunky. I think I, I, think I might have progressed. <laughs> so what I feel like is I'm showing you when you said I like working with beginner drawers, you know, I'm really a beginner, a beginner stitcher. <laughs> I'm showing you my beginning. And then this was made um, last year in the spring when when I really I hit a wall after after, you know, like so many of us, especially working, I think, in any kind of caring profession or, you know, working with young people in the health service or, you know, people and lots of people recognize this. But, you know, um, I think giving so much and then hitting a wall with my job and thinking I need to I need to find a way to um to focus on um, on my work and take care of myself, really. And this, um, so I repaired, this was a cashmere sweater that I bought in my husband's American. And um, we go to Goodwill stores when we go to America, which I love. And this was a cashmere sweater for a couple of dollars that had a couple of holes in, but then since got eaten by moths. Um, and I've written here that this repairing and its connection to mental health, I, I absolutely see as, um, as, as a, for certainly for me, as something that helps me, um, that calms me, that centers me. When I, when I work with repetitive stitching, my thoughts unravel and um, I'm present. And, and so this, this kind of star-like jumper was me working a lot of things out for the good. <laughs> And then I did my foot, then Angela, some of you I think here have done Angela's amazing quilt um, online um, groups and classes. Um, and she tried it out on me. So I was her guinea pig student and I obviously loved it. 
And we did that in a hot summer. And this was my first proper kind of, you know, experimental G's Bend log cabin inspired um, quilt. And so I just loved that I could make things that were functional for our home. And um, I'm like, God, give me anything. I was like, I'll just, I'm going to put, I'm going to quilt everything. This is my son Jackson's uh, curtain. And it was made out of um, a, a very broken one. And uh, and I use uh, an amazing association in Paris called La Réserve des Arts, which recycles artists and designers' materials to um, to be reused by creative people. And so I pay um, a yearly subscription, and then um, the materials are very um, a very low price. So I can find incredible things in um, just rummaging through bins of materials and stuff. I love, so that central kind of almost stained glass part was um, it's all found fabric from there. And then I made this cover for Jack's room as well. And then from Jackson's old um, uh, jeans. <laughs> and each, I don't know, well, anyone who has kids knows how fast they grow out of things. And they're just like, what are we gonna do with all these jeans? Um, and I, this is a very comfortable uh, apron. And I, I, in all my teaching, and um, I'm very interested in how constraint enables creativity. And I think that the tighter the constraint, the more kind of you exercise that muscle of imagination and possibility and, I've just seen it again and again and again. So, so if you if you go into something thinking I have every tool and every fabric and every possible thing in the entire world at my disposal, it doesn't. I don't think it 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 enables the kind of the the creative work that comes from having little. And I think the G's Ben quilt makers exactly show that. Um, so I'm interested. In, yeah, what I just have to hand. Um, what you do with what you've got uh and then and that inevitably is linked to being responsible with the environment and and understanding the preciousness of materials and just trying to live by those principles in kind of every way i think we do at home and then off the back of this work kind of coming and and i was posting about it and um i got this really wonderful invitation from the aga khan center in london to create botanical resources that would be shared freely um that centered on islamic gardens so again i this was this was where i really had to learn because i i didn't know about them particularly or um or understand what was um specific about their features and that was a very beautiful project and so um textiles came into those prompts and mixing textiles and and drawing and I held um, a, a weekend online um, session with a group of four artists um, who we worked over the weekend through drawing and then um, and then a few were really into stitch. And it was actually, I mean, I was supposed to be teaching them, but I feel that I got more from them than they got from me because I got really encouraged to draw with stitch. And I think that this is the first time, this is the first little test where I feel my line was liberated and I wasn't trying to do something um, that looked like what embroidery should look like. You know, it was kind of mine. Um, and then since then, um, learning from Angela actually about couching um, and doing and doing workshops with Angela where we've, we've combined drawing and thread. And actually my friend, uh, Kate Boucher, who's an amazing charcoal artist said in that one of the workshops that we're drawing in slow motion. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly how it feels. So couching feels very, very, um, I feel very at ease with couching because it really does feel like making a line and I'm free with it and splitting the threads and kind of making different weights of line. Um, so these are li literally trying to transcribe drawings that I made of irises um, in ink. Um, and then this is what's interesting. So with, for me, drawing is like my most immediate um, form of expression. And when I can, I, I draw. Um, and 
um, I'll just get snatches of time and it can be like a few minutes. And I have lots of sketches of plants and flowers often in the community garden near here. Um, and it's really interesting to then transcribe a very like relatively fast, well, two, three minute drawing into something that takes, you know, um, many, many hours. Um, so I need them both going on because <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't know how to just sit with something for hours and not have that fast paced work as well. So that rhythmic thing in a studio is really, really key. Um, and then I got, I discovered applique and I'm like, I am off. This is it. This is it. <laughs> and I wish I discovered it at art school because I think I, I studied painting and, and this feels really close to painting to me. Um, well, I'm painting on the left. So these these are these are really um, because we didn't have anything around. I didn't have any good uh, paper to paint on. I I figured I could, would just paint on the back of um, packaging, which I love. Which I then became so exciting because you get these different random shapes, and I have to try and work out the puzzle. And and this is some um, some sage. I think it's some. Uh, baby sage I think it's called that uh, was growing in our window box and then thought to try and transcribe that into um, into a plique um, mirroring the shapes you know these random shapes at the edges and using absolutely what we had um, in the home so there's all the all the pieces of fabric have stories they come from and that's how it how it um, very happy living with that I was Lots of you know that because I was sitting in front of it a lot, or having it growing out my head when you drew me. <laughs> Drawing is free. <laughs> um, yeah, that was really home, that one, for, for a long while. Um, yeah, so the, the fact that the, the fabric has stories and um, I love it. It's, I, can't, I couldn't paint in our tiny flat. That was impossible. But I can make big scale things because fabric you can fold up um, and it's not going to have fumes anywhere or and it's become this little kind of ecosystem I call it you know of um of renewing things and finding new purpose for things and then um yeah the textile piece becomes home and when we had to move out of here um we had to move out of our home for five and a half months and this traveled you know and and uh because that was home. So it was very interesting. That. Uh, and then another whole like kind of um, branch of this is uh, is the kimono. And, and there was an amazing exhibition. I think it was definitely at the um, Victoria and Albert Museum in London on the history of the kimono um, into, so um, very ancient ones into contemporary um, designers working with the kimono form. It was amazing. It came to the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris. Uh, I loved it, loved it, loved it. And um, there are quite a few little, really interesting Japanese textile shops in Paris, if you come and seek them out. Um, so this was made um, from drawings and, uh, and it's actually really ancient silk, the flower part. Um, that I found at La Reserve des Arts. Uh, and then this summer, um, again, working with Plique, uh, Plique in, a, in a, a studio that I was able to be in for a short time. And I'm just showing you um, this, because I think it's quite interesting looking at how to, how, I love the kind of work in progress shots where how colors have worked out. And, and I was trying to work out the balance of colors and um, yeah, like mixing paint, <laughs> simply, I feel it's like that. Um, but I like it because of how, how physical it is as well. It's like you you have to you you have to move your whole body a lot. And um, and this is uh, the residency that um, Angela and I um, managed to get together in a in a really interesting um, set of artist studios near me in Paris in the nineteenth called Doc, which was a squat. It was an abandoned school that was. Um, that was squatted by artists for a while that then they kind of turned it into a, a more official place. Um, and we called our short residency, it was two weeks, searching for green, um, B 
being interested in looking at nature in city spaces and how we might uh, transform uh, things we saw and collected into drawings and then textiles. Um, so what I had found um, is a couple of months before on the streets of Rotterdam was a parasol um, that I took the frame off and I love the weight of the fabric and I love the bleached out, the sun had bleached it. And then there was this, this dark square and, um, and we just lost somebody that we cared a lot about. And I wanted to make something kind of that, um, that was connected to him. And I think he would have liked to cape. <laughs> that was, I think that was what was in my mind. And I think uh, I thought that, yeah, the cape was what was what I wanted to make. So I'm showing you that and I'll show you how it's, lots of people have seen this work already, but um, what was really uncanny is one year later, almost exactly right next to my studio, I found a red version and that's it in my studio. <laughs> so there's gonna be a red sister um, to this cape. Um, but that's the thing, I think I didn't say it before, but this is really key, is you become a magnet for the things you're looking for, if you know what you're looking for. <laughs> you don't have to know it consciously, you don't have to know it consciously, but you have to know it in your heart kind of thing. You have to know it, you, you get pulled to things. It's very powerful. Um, so we collected things that were just growing in the pavement and out of, these were like the, the paintings that I made in lockdown, looking at street flowers. Um, so really humble flowers and then transforming them into a, into a pattern that I might work in there. So this is what my cape turned out like, um, which uh, I think has a lot of connection to the amazing Matisse um, capes that he made and the, um, but yeah, that's uh, I, I I'm I'm very proud of that work because it did uh, my poor little domestic sewing machine almost had got got completely I got completely I ran that big thick canvas through it determined to make this and there it is and there's me wearing it a joyful thing and then um, when Angela had left and she, because I was, she was going back to Wales and I was, I was here, I just collected all the fabric and couldn't throw it away. And uh, there was the Elsa Schiaparelli exhibition um, at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. And Elsa Schiaparelli, if you don't know, I'm sure lots of you do, blew me away. It's like, she was just talk about energy and creativity and searching and daring and it's like she was on a foundation course I loved it and uh and yeah she made a lot of gloves so I made a glove from the scraps that were on the floor um and then this piece on the right is actually um this applique um blanket there's a little tiny square there which is from um a piece of Welsh, Welsh quilt, which is Angela brought with her, which was about 150 years old. So a little tiny piece. And we worked from these little pieces, trying to kind of respond to the pattern um, and make something contemporary. And I'm really keen to like work with that more, that you take something that existed that was designed a long time ago and then, and then find your way with it. And this was a blanket that I, this again thinking when you make something and it becomes like home. This is the little bed that I sleep on in the kind of teacher quarters when I teach in Normandy. <laughs> and it makes a very bleak room feel like quite nice. And then uh, and then Angela again um, did a, a workshop with my students and I followed as a student. And we, we worked from um, with the idea of breath and how you might make um, textiles responding to breath. So this was a little, um, it's supposed to be a lung, but it reads like a heart, I think. Um, but I was interested in it becoming a sculptural object then, you know, that what I've been showing you are functional things. Um, and this, uh, this, this felt more like textiles as sculpture, of which this does too. So this was, this was an idea that came again from the experience of lockdown where we weren't, we couldn't go into the parks and gardens. And we looked at spring happening through the fence at a distance. And so when the next following spring, we could be close to blossom, I had my head in it 
permanently. I think I was just in the trees, like smelling it and loving it. And I wanted to make something that was like that experience, that kind of blissful experience of being close and inside this beautiful tree. <laughs> um, so this I, it is, um, is, is a strange kind of veil or kind of headpiece that you would literally put your head into and just, and then have permanent um, shadows of flowers all the time. So that was a appliqued on. And then this is from drawing is free, just thinking how could I just turn some of my drawing is free drawings, portrait drawings into textiles and what would that look like? And what would it be like if I wore one? Um, so I just get ideas and then I have to see them through. And this one was is on the back of a silk bomber jacket that you can get really cheaply, actually. I don't think they're very fashionable, but that's probably why. I don't know. But I like it. <laughs> uh, and I'm coming to the end, actually, because this um, here I'm just noting, noting about the future. And um, I have so many ideas for textiles. It's like it's just a question of time. Um, one that I found that was really exciting was like literally painting with watercolor on silk and what that what that does you know I'd love to test that um learning more about um about embroidery um and and finding form for my drawings through embroidery and I'm working on something that I haven't photographed here because it's it's very kind of embryonic but in the um in the summer I collected a lot of fallen moths um and there's one particular design that I that I love of the moth that I've made into a kimono design that I'm making with um, found fabrics. And I want that kimono then to be something that I wear, that I then draw myself wearing. Um, so what I'm imagining is this kimono that's the kind of, it's an object that's in the space. And then there are these um, full size drawings, which are part, you know, the fabric and part bits of, I can see of my body. Um, and then the moth would also be shown as well. So from this tiny beginning into like these other, and this connection to nature and how a tiny thing could just spark all the different. Um, and I think there's always, there's always some deep motivation inside of me to fly. So I often, <laughs> I often want to fly over the like what birds and wings and pattern that's always keeps coming back, coming back. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing is um, this, uh, is the mo is most kind of recent thing I think I've done where I've, I've gone like, wow, the potential in that, I'm really excited. I learned the stay chain stitch, which is a really satisfying bold line. And, um, just be bolder about putting my drawings literally onto um this is a wool shirt that I got in a secondhand shop you know finding a quality um garment that to recycle and then and then adding the drawing and uh yeah and I yeah I like wearing that <laughs> um yeah so I wear it and that that's also that's that's exciting too to feel that I could make things to wear um and I have no idea on the time scale. I hope I haven't gone on too long. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but is that all right? That's perfect, Chloe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You really give um, a fantastic, I think, impression of what, how an artist, you're coming at this from being an artist as opposed to, you know, um, learning from a pattern. Lots of us might have learned when we were kids you know cross stitch patterns and you had to stick to that but you're being very bold with your design and you're just going for it which I think is amazing which I love I absolutely love one thing you said actually you said that um constraint enables creativity I I love that phrase and I'm just wondering if that is what actually you do on a on a Monday morning you know, because you constrain us to that two minutes or three minutes. Um, it might be nice if you just describe the Monday mornings to the um to, to, to people who are here who haven't actually participated in it before. Yeah, so it's um it's an open invitation to anyone, um, no matter what you know, an experience or I mean literally to anyone <laughs> to turn up. 
And I have a playlist of music, which is very eclectic, as people, I can see people who draw with me here. Everybody, <laughs> you know, loves, what's the coming next. Everybody loves your playlist. It does get, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it all went a bit somber and, and then disco, the disco came back, didn't it? I think people were relieved. But anyway, so we, get, we have, um, yeah, a playlist. And and then I there's no speaking. I think it's important that I don't speak very much. I mean, it's not about um, it's not about me actually. <laughs> That's what's really key as well. Is is I just animate it and I I always pose first because uh, I think. Um, uh, that's that's a that's something I hold very important in what I do is that I always ask people to do what I'm doing to you know something, yeah. So the fact that I'm drawing too and posing is important. Um, so I pose and it I you know for the length of the track of music, and then um, and then I look for somebody else and I ask them if they'd like to pose and most people say yes that's fine and then they don't know what kind of track of music is going to come and then magical things happen where sometimes I, mean, I actually see Elka here but it did happen to you didn't it it was like just the this track of music and the, the pose and it was like oh like everyone felt it it was just like boom that's that's something that happens you know not not with everyone or not every week or um uh I don't know it's something melds with the song and the person and it's, it's yeah and 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 everyone is beautiful and we thought that as as one of the one of the uh, participants wrote a beautiful poem about how we fall in love with every face but when you draw a face you draw the face you're like oh look at the shape of their mouth wow <laughs> so you just and because you're on screen and it's so close you um yeah, it's incredibly intimate and people are incredibly open and it's incredibly emotional. I don't think it's for the faint hearted, actually, because <laughs> it's very emotional. Yeah. But the thing is, you see, I think I think, Chloe, anyone can anyone can stay still for two minutes, you know, and the thing <laughs> is, you, you just have that two minutes to crack it out. And it seems like a huge challenge. And it is a huge challenge, actually, at the time. But once you get used to it and sure, what harm if you only do one eye and a half a nose and a mouth those are the ones I feel are the most interesting you know there's lots of people of different um actually and you're great you always post you know you'll if somebody tags you on Instagram you'll post that up on your page and you get to see everybody's different styles you know and there's some things that are just incredible I think the people you do this actually you draw with um watercolor I think that's really brave oh my goodness that is that's really brave because of course that can go anywhere you know that can go all over the place so I'm quite interested in the fact that you are so interested in, I know you love textiles but textiles is quite maybe it's a repetitive thing but it's quite restrictive in that you get a definite line whereas in your watercolor it could go anywhere and you embrace that as well which I, I find it amazing, you know. I'd love to know, would anybody like to op to just unmute themselves and ask Chloe a question? Would anybody be interested? I just wanted to say something. I think it's actually easier working in a, in a discipline that's like not one you've been trained in or had an education in. I think you're a lot more daring. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know any rules, so I just do it. You know what I mean? Like, I think if you if you sometimes you can be you can be taught in such a way where it's like, no, no, until you've got the exact right thing, you can't. And, and Angela is amazing about that. because She's always like, I say, what about that? And she's like, just try it. Like, Why wouldn't you just try it? Like, well, yeah. OK, <laughs> what's going to happen? And, and the thing about bravery, there's a brilliant quote um, by Andy Warhol in his a book called Andy Warhol from A to B and back. At the, the philosophy of Andy Warhol from the A to B and back again. And apparently people would say, like, Andy, you're so brave, like being an artist and, you know, all his famous friends and stuff. And he's like, I'm not brave. Babysitters are brave. Um, evil can evil is brave. <laughs> it's like, what is actually going to happen to you? What risk? I mean, but it does feel and I'm not undermining because I know the risk is, I mean, it's like all engulfing and kind of, <gasps> or, you know, when you see your drawings come out of you and you're like, ah, oh, what's that? Um, yeah. So I know it does feel, it feels well, think busy, it's amazing about the session. Like for well, for me anyway, I, I'd love I'd love to hear from Leslie actually if I could unmute Leslie. But if for me anyway, it starts off 
crazily bad, you know, really, really bad. And then by the time we get to the last drawing, I kind of think, oh, gosh, maybe it's come together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you're so what if it doesn't if it doesn't look good, it doesn't matter. But the amazing thing is you have lost yourself in that hour. And you have completely, it's its just the start of the week that I just love. I just absolutely thank you for that. I, th I think it's quite remarkable. And the other thing, if you don't mind me saying, Chloe, is that um, Chloe does has this amazing Patreon um, account where well, there's a few things. You There's a few things going on. First of all, you're talking to artists. Isn't that right? You you actually, that's free to listen to, I think. Mm -hmm. And the other is the um, the Patreon subscription where Chloe creates a booklet every month. Now, how you do this is, is that this is another remarkable thing that you do. Create a booklet of prompts and ideas and thoughts on a topic, usually associated with the weather and the current environment as we see it at the moment the bare trees or whatever is happening right now and uh, giving you food for thought and then we lash into it for an hour and a half something like that is chloe but now we're at the end of the month yeah and that is such fun i love it because you're again it's drawing prompts but it's loose and it's kind of making you and there's no there's no constriction there's no refined you have to do this that or the other and the amazing thing is you while your prompts are the same for everybody in attendance the drawings are completely different and it's amazing to see them at the end you know I, I just love that I really enjoy that so just I just wanted to say that you know if you, I hope you don't mind I know you weren't going to no. say that Chloe you weren't going to even mention it but it's a big <laughs> part of what you do and it's yeah it's fantastic it's yeah, no, I love it. I mean, I think the the whole the thing with that is is I thought I have to make something I would do anyway. You know, I don't. It's 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 something I'm. It's all the, in things I'm interested in anyway. And the fact that people want to support me and and share in it that all the better. That's amazing. I mean, I never believed. I never imagined it would have gone. You know, I would have that many people. It's like a it's like a kind of school. You know, but we 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 don't exist in a physical place. We just everyone's making this work. I love that and connecting yes, with people I would never have met tribe, otherwise. I, I kind of feel it's like a tribe. They, you, you know, <laughs> That's uh, I don't want to say cult. <laughs> no, that would be no god. No. It is like a little tribe, <laughs> isn't it? And and, and uh, we're all kind of in the same boat, even though we're scattered like there might be people from Australia on this call or whatever you know which is always unbelievable and you know it's just so cool but anyway I wondered would anybody like to actually ask um ask Chloe a question about anything um I wondered Carmel if I can of course, ask a question there yeah I was just wondering do you ever um take the fabric and freely kind of without a reference work with it in shapes and things like that you know like the way you might draw from your head if you know something very well um that's a good question I just saw you Francis and Fra you're an amazing textile artist so I was very tough that you're <laughs> your beautiful work um uh well um I mean I I never draw I I that's a really good question because I I draw from observation in a in a in you know with humility and the fact like I can't invent a shape that would be as beautiful as what I see I never th I don't think my imagination is that good <laughs> you know so I, I I like I try and get them all inside and then with the with the big applique I don't ever draw them on I just freely cut them you know so but I I haven't just kind of gone into the total unknown with shape mm. which would be a, yeah I would, yeah that would be cool I, yeah I think it's an interesting thing to do I did it um once with a series of gesture drawing well I called them drawings but they were mm -hmm. with ink and um I just said to myself I know boats so well I know the shape of boats so well and I've been working with them um in a, a in a tapestry so I just said one day, just do the do the shape that's in your head, you know, and it was very interesting to do it. I haven't done it since, but I must go back to it because it was great to just trust your 
your own idea of, you know, some of the shapes didn't turn out great, but some mm. of them were, you know, things I liked. I do, I do believe that if it has gone inside, you are, you're sensitive to, I think the forms are just more sensitive that you might, that might come out of you. So mm. yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, drawing is amazing for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you encourage that with, you know, drawing with your eyes closed or with the wrong hand or, you know, yeah. that, which is great. It really does free things up. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then look again after having done that. And it's and yeah. Yeah. No, I loved what you showed the other night that I've I stayed in my mind that beautiful. Um, oh, with the honeycomb yeah. weaving. Oh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. It's a, it's a very old piece and I'm kind of repairing oh. it and trying to um, reinvent it a bit. So yeah. that's interesting from the repair point of view. And I was really interested when you asked that question, did I think of it as drawing? Mm. Um, and I've been thinking about that. And yeah, there are certainly elements of drawing in line and shape, you know, whatever you make. Mm, yeah. Um, so that was really, really good question to think mm. about. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> Thanks, Emilia and Francis. We have a question from Denise, who has asked, just wanted to ask again, what was the stitch you used in the recycled blouse in the last slide, as I missed it? Thank it you. was chain stitch, and I saw it. Um, there's a young Mexican designer who's showing an amazing space in Paris, which you should all know about all textile interested people. It's called 19M. And it's um, it's where it now houses the École Lesage, which is the, the school of embroidery that all the haute couture, that's who uh, Schiaparelli worked with actually. So the school is housed in this space. It's, it's near me, it's kind of on the, on the edges of Paris. Um, and it's got an amazing, um, uh, amazing program of textile artists from around the world. I saw embroidery from women um, from Dakar um, in the summer. That was amazing. And this young Mexican artist whose name I forget right now, although I, I got my students to take, but what she um, she used um, chain stitch on on a lot of some of it. Some of it looking very much like. Um, like a, a flamenco costume or something like that, you know, you know, the kind of like thick embroidered line. So it was really very stark, like kind of white on black. And oh yeah, Carla Fernandez, thank you. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, I, I drum that into my students for like a month and I can't remember her name. No, it's a very good show. I love, talk about playful and, and range of ways of working and really, really good. I loved it. Yeah, thank lovely. you. Someone has brought in a lovely uh, a website there for 19M. You, you also mentioned, Chloe, um, that there were some Japanese textile shops in Paris. Yes. It would be lovely to know about them and yeah. whether, you know, they'd be accessible to us. I, I guess they'd have yeah. websites, would they? Yeah. You know, you know, There's, you know. Um, I don't know if anyone follows public library quilts. I love I love um, that account and I learn a lot from them. And they posted about uh, one in the Marais that I went to when I wanted to learn about kimonos. And it was really like the Japanese woman uh, made me a pattern. So I'm, I'm like, how do you make a kimono? Which is not rocket science, is it? <laughs> but I thought there must be like a there must be like a proportion that's traditional you know just I wanted to yeah well then there is obviously but she made me a little paper little paper cutout which I still have a little tiny tiny mini pattern <laughs> it's really sweet and, um that's in the Marais and there's one um in the 18th that I've been to as well um yeah with lots of lovely samples of traditional fabric and sashiko threads and that kind of stuff but yeah, I'll find them. I'll pass them on to you, Carmel. I'll find the two addresses, the one, two that I know about. That'd be lovely, actually, Chloe, or if, if you had, if they have Instagram pages or something and we can... Yeah, the one in the Marais definitely does. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank mm. you very much. And we have a friend, actually, a friend of the network called Rebecca Devani. Have you come across Rebecca at all? I think she might live in Paris. I've never met her before myself, but she 
um, you know, she shares her information with us and she's a newsletter and she does tours of Paris, actually, textile tours. Ah. Yeah. Um, where she goes around all the suppliers, I guess. Uh, we have we have Fiona. Fiona is our chairman, actually, Chloe. And she says, love your thought. You become a magnet for what you are looking for. <laughs> now I have to try and explain that to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> You're like, I'm just, I can't help recently. it. I'm a magnet. <laughs> yeah. Fiona was in Japan recently and bought, I, I, you must have brought an extra suitcase home, Fiona, with all the stuff between papers and threads and everything. A wonderful night, Chloe, full of inspiration. Thank you for a wonderful night, Fiona. Well, that's lovely. Mm-hmm. No, there, from Fiona. Um, yeah, very funny. Oh, I love it that people are sewing there too. It's so nice. What well, lovely. <laughs> I can see some hands moving in the textile. So unless anybody has any other questions, we might say goodbye and good night and let you have a rest finally, Chloe. So <laughs> considering you were in Rotterdam this morning, <laughs> I'm sure you're not. Um, yeah, being a filmmaker this morning, I was very happy with my, I'm like, okay, now I want to be a filmmaker. So I'd, <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. It's on. It's it's this morning's video from Rotterdam. <laughs> that we did. It was like she just said action, and this lady walked across the across the four <laughs> The train station was very cool. No, there's there is there is a kind of arrogance of of the fine artist, you know, where you think you can do anything, kind of thing. I know my sister, my sister, who's a writer, has taught fine artists, and then the. They say, you know, I'm just going to write a novel. It's like, yeah, really, are you? You know, <laughs> you think you can do everything because you just work free material, any any material. <laughs> but I felt very welcome in your um in your textile space. So thank you because I, you know, I'm 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 really young in this game. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, thank um, you. It, a lady has asked here, your work is so beautiful, Chloe. Can I ask if the recording might be available? I have a friend who would love to have seen it. Yes, I'm sure it, it will be available. We put it up on the Cork Textile Network YouTube channel. If that's okay with you, Chloe. Yeah, yeah. It'll be freely available to yeah. anyone. Okay. And Caroline, lovely to hear about your work, Chloe. Thanks so much again. Caroline does amazing work as well. She incorporates Sashiko. It's beautiful work. And, uh, and thank you very much, Chloe. You are inspiring. Denise, thank you. Wonderful talk. Ellen, thank you so much. I love the conversation. Oh, tuned in from Philadelphia. How amazing is that? Wow. Thank you so much, Ellen. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you, Carmel and Chloe, for an inspiring talk. So, so that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the evening. And thank you for tuning in, everybody. And happy Christmas. Wow. Oh, we can have a glass of wine now. <laughs> happy Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hopefully, see you Monday, so some of you. Bye. 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 Bye.